Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. I wonder if any of you have seen the show already. There we go, yay! <laughs> I have to admit, it was not easy going to bring the objects to San Francisco, but when I saw what the object list was going to be, I fought and uh, happy, happy to do so, because it, the show looks just gorgeous in, in our De Young galleries. I want to say that it is really appropriate for me to be here tonight and speak to you because this is the occasion of the centenary of the discovery of Tut Ankh Amun's opening of the tomb, the discovery Howard Carter's. I don't know how many of you knew that. I mean, it's been in the press. They're making a big deal of it. But in fact, uh, this is 100 years since uh, Howard Carter discovered the tomb. And I have to say, um, I am, I believe, the only curator who has been the curator of both King Tut exhibitions in San Francisco. Uh, you know, worldwide, probably I'm the only curator who has done two King Tut exhibitions. And the, and the amazing thing about it is they were in first in 1979, and then in 2009, and they opened exactly the same month in June, and it was precisely 30 years apart. Now, for the ancient Egyptians, 30 years after a king starts his rule, 30 years afterwards, he has something called a said festival, which is a wonderful uh, festival that, that rejuvenates the king and uh, gives him the power to go on and continue his, his pharaohship uh, after the, you know, the gods have, have looked upon him with favor. So I thought, OK, 30 years to the month. This is perfect. This is my said festival. And, and from now on, I'm rejuvenated, and I'll start all over again. So. <laughs> Uh, so that's, that's King Tut, but today I'm going to speak to you about Ramses II, who ruled for much longer than the boy king and accomplished much more in his life so that we call him today Ramses the Great. Those of you who've been in the exhibition know that it opens with this statue, the upper part of a colossal statue of Ramses, and he's wearing the crown of Upper Egypt. And the exhibition is a unique show. It explores the life and the accomplishments of a distinguished military officer who was a crown prince, um, Ramses the Great, uh, under his, his father, Seti I. And when Seti I died, he eventually became the king of Egypt. And he is regarded as the most celebrated and the mightiest pharaoh of the new kingdom, which is Egypt's golden age, when it was wealthy and powerful. He was the third pharaoh of the 19th dynasty and was not only worshipped as a god during his lifetime, but was venerated far into the future. Ramses was born around 1300 BC, and he was considered the divine son of the god Amun. Uh, the story is that um, Amun visited his mother in the dark of the night, and um, as a result, Ramses was born. So um, he had an earthly mother and a divine father. So he ruled as a god in the eyes of his people for an incredibly long period of time, um, you know, 66, 67 years, around 1279 to 1213 BC. And that was the second longest reign of any pharaoh. 
He lived for an astonishing 92 years when the life expectancy of a, an ordinary Egyptian was more like 34 or 35 years. So you can see he lived a lot longer than Tut, and for that reason, um, and he, he was pharaoh for a lot lo longer, for that reason he was able to do so much more than Tut, who, who died at such a young age and was pharaoh for such a short time. But um, when you see him in the exhibition, you'll see that he, uh, he's wearing a crown of, of Upper Egypt and other uh, statues, you see him wearing a different crown, the crown of Lower Egypt, showing that he was the king of Upper and Lower Egypt, that is, all of Egypt. And like many of the, of the uh, statues, that you'll see of him all over Egypt because he was, I don't know, a megalomaniac and <laughs> you'll see more of his statues in Egypt than any other king. And um, in this case, it's a colossal head from an oversized, uh, over life-size statue and it was usurped from another king. Now recarving a statue of another king with Ramses' image was a sign of divine authority. The king was the living god, he was Horus, and all of the rulers before him were also the living god Horus. After, after they died, uh, they became Osiris, uh, they went off to uh, the afterlife to live with the gods, and they themselves were a god. But you know that smile, that ra the round cheeks, uh, the face is unmistakably Ramses. And you'll notice when you see his statues, there is a protruding brow, and he's looking right out at you. Consider how high up he must have been as a colossal statue, but he's looking at you from a position of on high, uh, even though he has direct eye contact with you. So um, here you see this gorgeous bracelet with the eye of Horus on it, because the exhibition also includes some of the most dazzling royal treasures ever seen in America. And this bracelet is one of my favorite. Uh, when you go there, you'll see a video uh, where I describe it in detail. It was found on a, um, a, the mummy of a king named Sheshank II, who ruled about 300 years after Ramses. And it's shown in lapis lazuli and carnelian and gold, the sacred eye of Horus, which was a complex symbol of protection and wholeness throughout Egyptian history. And it represents the eye you can see it's like a falcon eye, uh, that the god Horus lost in the battle with his uncle Seth. And uh, the god Thoth later put it back in, he restored the eye, and so it came to symbolize wholeness and healing. So um, one thing to say is that all of the objects are from Egyptian museums. And it's a state-of-the-art exhibition, and it lets visitors walk through to see some of these grand objects while viewing multimedia productions. So um, I'm hoping that those productions give you a deeper understanding and a, and a greater context for the art on view. And by the way, there's also upstairs an immersive virtual reality experience and uh, there you have Nefertari, uh, Ramses II, great royal wife, uh, flying through um, Abu Simbel, the temples of Abu Simbel, and her own tomb, um, which is a gorgeous thing. And um, I mean, how else can you show something about the massive ar ar architectural feats that were realized by Ramses the Great? So uh, here you see Ramses as a sphinx, and um, showing you it from the front and from the side. Uh, in the six decades of Ramses' reign, 
the Egyptian empire prospered as he secured and expanded the country's borders. And when he died, few remembered there was ever a time before he was their pharaoh. And you see him here as a sphinx. You have the king's head on a lion's body. From the front, you see on the left-hand side, you see him making an offering of a, um, a jar with a stopper, and the stopper is, has a ram's head. That is symbolic of the god Amun, or amun Re, And um, so he is worshiping, in fact, as a king, as a sphinx, he is worshiping. But from the side, if you only see the side, it's showing a, a beautiful lion's body. And I love it. You can see the ribs. You can see the, the ridge of his spine uh, leading to the tail. You see the tail curled around. It's a beautiful rendition of a lion. But at the same time, it doesn't continue as a lion, and you see human hands making the offering. It's quite an extraordinary work of art. It's made of limestone, and I think the, the artist has done a remarkable job of merging two forms. There we go. Well, throughout his long period as a ruler, Ramses maintained an unprecedented construction campaign that guaranteed that future generations would know him as a great and a good ruler. And he was even a legend in his own time. I mean, you know, here he is creating out of the cliffs of Nubia this incredible temple that... Um, Just want to see if I can go back one. We'll leave it here. <laughs> um, it was his sacred duty, he felt, to restore earlier monuments, which he did. Uh, some of them had fallen into disrepair. And then he undertook construction throughout the land um, with buildings that would honor the gods, and the king's predecessors um, leading up to him. So he left behind an unequal legacy of cities, buildings, temples, obelisks, colossal statues, and impressive written accounts proclaiming his, his famous exploits. And the exhibition has models of some of these great uh, architectural feats, as well as photo blow-ups of several of these architectural wonders. And this, you know, is Ramses' temple at Abu Simbel, and uh, it was carved into the limestone cliffs in northern Nubia, today's Sudan. Um, and it is the largest of his temples in Nubia, and one of the most iconic monuments in ancient Egypt. You know, each one of these statues uh, that you're looking at is 60 feet high. And some people have called this an ego cast in stone, uh, for obvious reason. Um, I mean, I'm showing this slide from the 19th century that shows a man standing on his lap. It gives you some... In, I mean, it, each one of these is about the height of a 60... of a six-story building, let's say. And it's, it's dedicated to the sun god, Ray Harakti, as well as to Ramses II himself as a god. There's a central corridor, and you can see this better and, um, when you go into the exhibition, that runs from the entrance into a sanctuary in the back, some 200 feet. And then there are four statues in the back. And it is aligned to the sun's position at the spring and the fall equinox in February and October. And on those days, the sun shines into the front, and it lights up three of the four statues. 
It's amazing, amazing uh, engineering feat for the ancients. And then, of course, you, you probably know that Lake Nasser, with the, with the Aswan Dam, Lake Nasser was um, flood, going to flood this area. So it, this, you know, step by step, piece by piece, they dug up this temple and the temple of Nefertari right next to it and created a, a new cliff and that's where it is today, and the sun still shines on those days into the inner sanctuary. Well, um, there we go. Um, Ramses also added to the temple of uh, the temple complex of Karnak and the Luxor Temple. And uh, he commissioned the gigantic Ramesseum, his memorial temple in western Thebes, and, and many other buildings, uh, far more than any other king had done before him. And the Ramesseum mortuary temple was called in Egyptian a mansion of millions of years. And it was the location for rituals that sustained the king's ka, or his life force. And that was where his cult would be carried out after his death. And the name Ramesseum was coined by Jean-Francois Champollion, the early 19th century scholar who first deciphered the hieroglyphic script. And that was in 1822, just 200 years ago. We have another celebration uh, for that anniversary this year, and I thought that was really a good thing for us to have the Ramses exhibition during these two great anniversaries. I really like the statue of Ramses because it's just, uh, it seems to me more appealing. We're looking at him as um, a young man, and um, he's holding a heka scepter, which, which is um, a shepherd's crook, which was symbolic of kingship. After all, he shepherds his people. And we know that soon the name Ramses became synonymous with kingship. And in fact, nine pharaohs after him called themselves Ramses in his honor. And he is regarded as a ruler who came to epitomize power and wealth of ancient Egypt at its height. And in addition to that, remember he was a warrior, and remember he was always victorious, but as you'll see, he also secured peace with his neighbors. And um, you know, to, to this day, he's still considered the most outstanding and celebrated of the pharaohs, aptly known as Ramses the Great. So the statue we're looking at now is the upper part of what was a seated statue of Ramses. It's granodiorite, a very hard stone. And, and um, as I said, his, he's holding the symbol of kingship. And notice that round face. That is Ramses. Whenever you see these high cheekbones, slightly bulging almond-shaped eyes, and that sweet, sweet smile. There's a little drilling on either side of the mouth. And, and um, you know, these, this, in this statue, you're looking at Ramses as a forever youthful ruler. And um, notice in his right hand, he's wearing a, a bracelet with the sacred eye of Horus, very similar to the one we saw earlier. It was traditional, became a very, very common symbol to show health, uh, healing, but also protection uh, in this world and in the next. Of course, this isn't a visual likeness of the king, but an idealized image. Uh, we know it doesn't look like him at all because we have his mummy. And uh, we know this isn't what his face looked like. Uh, they've been forensic portraits, and his face is quite angular. His nose was quite different than this. Uh, 
But this is the way he liked to have himself portrayed. Well, that statue was found in Tanis, which is a site in the eastern delta. Uh, but it probably represents a statue that was standing in a new capital city that Ramses created uh, very near there in Per Ramses. You know, that means House of Ramses. Let's see if this works. There we go. Does it work? I'm not, I'm not seeing it on the screen. Mm, there we are. There it is. And notice where Tanis is. Now, uh, before this, the New Kingdom uh, kings had their, had their capital uh, in Thebes. So you look and you see on the left-hand side in Upper Egypt, you see Karnak and Luxor. So he moved the capital into the Delta area, and that was probably the seat of where the R Ramesses family comes from. So uh, family roots there, also ability to fight uh, some of the traditional en enemies of Egypt that were up, up um, in the north. And when he created his capital, he had over 50 statues of himself placed throughout the cities. And some of the statues that he created of himself <laughs> were larger than the statues of the gods that stood uh, alongside them. So um, the statues from Per Ramesses, uh, Per Ramis, uh, ended up in Tanis after uh, the branch of the Nile silted over in his capital city, and block by block, statue by statue, everything ended up in Tanis, which really then was the ultimate location of many of Ramsey's statues and buildings. And um, at this time, it was about 150 years after Ramsey um, uh, created his capital city that they moved everything to the new city called Tanis. And um, we're going to see a lot of things from the pharaohs of the 21st dynasty. Now, remember, Ramses is 19th century dynasty. So 21st dynasty, when they created a new seat of power in Tanis. And um, in Tanis, the name of Ramses II continued, and, and he was known as the great ancestor. So one of the, our favorite things in the exhibition shows Ramses as a warrior. We've seen him as a builder. I might say he was a pretty good family man. He had over 100 children. <laughs> we know of eight wives. I don't know whether, how many other wives <laughs> to create a, a hundred. Um, uh, but um, so he was a family man, he was a builder, and he was a great warrior. And here you see him. Um, he is holding the hair of some of the traditional enemies of Egypt, and with one blow, he is about to smite them all. He repelled invasions by the Nubians from the south, the Libyans on the western frontier. There were pirates coming down from the Mediterranean, the Sea Peoples, uh, and then the Hittites. Hittites came from Turkey, um, and then he fought them in uh, the Syrian coast. So he was a mighty warrior king with an army estimated, can you believe this, to have totaled 100,000 men. And it was his most famous battle that we hear about, and you'll see a reenactment of it in the exhibition. It took place in Syria at a site called Kadesh, and it's on the Orontes River, and it was a trade route, and it was really important for uh, the economic interests of both the Hittites in Turkey 
and the Egyptians. And they came down upon each other, and they fought in Kadesh. And he talks about it in many of his statues and his temples that he had erected in his own glory. So it's a multimedia um, reenactment, as I say. And it, it, it tells you about, it's so interesting, I mean, it tells you about spies and deception and intrigue, and it's dramatically shown in the exhibition. But no matter what battle it is, Ramses is always triumphant, and uh, which is not only good for his reputation, of course, but he is an all-powerful king, and uh, he rep it also represents order over chaos. So anytime the king is, is triumphant, uh, this is what's happening. You're seeing uh, order brought back, or what the co Egyptian concept of mat uh, over chaos. And chaos is char characterized by the foreigners. Uh, incidentally, the Hittite version of this battle is somewhat different. Uh, it does exist, and uh, I've seen it. And, uh, you know, at most, I guess it was a draw. <laughs> but ultimately, it ended with a peace treaty, which is very much like our own peace treaties, or, you know, through the years, a kind of non aggression peace treaty. Uh, they won't fight with each other, and furthermore, if either country is, is attacked, then the other one will come and help them um, to be victorious. So uh, that was sealed, and uh, there was peace for over 100 years. So, um, you know, these were two previously, more, I don't know, what would you say, mortal enemies who now have found peace with one another. So um, there you see him, and he's got the battle axe, and uh, he's about to clobber them. When you see this in person, really notice the color that's still on the, this, this block, because it is so vibrant. I mean, you know, and, and the expressions on the faces of these mortal enemies. Um, now, this is made out of faience. These are plaques showing these same enemies. Um, and and uh, it's not paint, it's faience, which is a ceramic that is made of ground quartz. And so these colors are as bright today as they were when they were created. And, uh, you know, these were images that were found on palace walls and perhaps even on the floors of the palaces. So symbolically, the king would walk over his enemies and subdue them that way. So, um, as I say, uh, his successes on the battlefield might not always be inclusive or real. Uh, what he describe how he describes himself may not be accurate, but he is always portrayed as the victor trampling his enemies. And um, despite these exaggerations that Egypt enjoyed uh, regional military superiority and security under his leadership and prospered. So um, it's, it's, it's um, a good time. He is securing their borders. Gold is coming up from Nubia. Gold is coming from the eastern deserts. Uh, it's a wealthy time. And um, I know it's just um, a time when building and uh, the beautiful jewelry that I'll be showing you is, is being created throughout Egypt. And there is a substantial period of peace as he continues to secure uh, the borders. The tomb of Ramses the Great was plundered in antiquity, and through the eons there were f flash floods that um, 
f created uh, the streams of flood and brought down um, rocks and stones into, into his tomb. And uh, so the exhibition that you, you uh, that we have in San Francisco has incredible works of art that show what a royal tomb would have included. Uh, probably a lot of you have seen the King Tut exhibitions, um, but these are objects from other royal tombs from before Ramesses and then after him. And you have examples of these beautiful, stunning, broad collars, um, pectorals, necklaces, armlets, armlets, uh, earrings, um, sandals, gold sandals, and um, uh, so on. You know, men as well as women were wearing all of these gorgeous things. And you get some idea of what Ramsey's tomb would have included. And, you know, it represents the extraordinary sophistication and cosmopolitan nature of Egyptians uh, and the Egyptian New Kingdom Empire. And um, as I say, we have Middle Kingdom um, necklaces like this from around, I don't know, uh, 2000 to about 1600 BC, and then um, from a later period of from about 1000 to 700 BC. But it tells you something about the fabulous wealth of the pharaohs and the extravagance of their burials. I mean, the workmanship is just gorgeous. Uh, the choice of colors has, again, to do with symbolism. And um, the um, on each end, you see a falcon head, uh, Horus, perhaps, and uh, just absolutely gorgeous. Here's an example from the later period, and it is a massive necklace. It weighs about 18 pounds, and it is solid gold. <laughs> it was known as the Gold of Honor, and it was a, a tradition that was handed down uh, f from about a thousand years earlier of the king giving such a necklace to a worthy a military officer or somebody who has done something really important for the Egyptians. And um, you can see it has, you, actually it would have been worn the other way around. You get the coils on the front and where the tassels are, this goes down your back so that you're balanced. I mean, however heavy it is, you're balanced. And it's from a mummy, um, King Susanese the I, who reigned in the 21st dynasty and dates to about 1000 BC. And it's in perfect condition because gold doesn't, you know, nothing happens to gold throughout the eons. And um, as I say, it's, it's uh, a, a tradition that continues through Egyptian history. But here it's on a king, so it's likely thought that the god gave it to the king. And um, uh, again, that was found in this tomb complex in Tanis, and so was this ewer uh, that is absolutely beautiful. And uh, it, it um, you know, it comes from about three or four hundred years after Ramses, the tomb does, but it was an heirloom from, and it says in the cartouche, the name of Akhmos, the first pharaoh of the 18th dynasty. And uh, so it was earlier than Ramses, who reigned in the 19th dynasty. But here it was found in a 21st dynasty tomb, so telling us that this was an heirloom that was precious and was brought into the tomb for the next world. And um, it's just made out of sheets of gold, and it really is gorgeous. So as I say, gold was plentiful, silver was not, and this is a silver coffin that held the mummy of Sheshank II. 
and he was a king from Dynasty 22, and that his, his tomb was found in the same complex uh, in Tanis. And the coffin is made out of solid silver. And it has the model head of a hawk, which might represent Horus, the god Horus, or uh, Osiris Sokar, uh, who also is, has a falcon head, and he was the god of the underworld and a funerary god. So um, this coffin was far rarer than one made of solid gold would have been at that time and would have been quite expensive. So these tombs, this complex of tombs that were found in Tanis, were also robbed in antiquity, um, but not, not as much. And so much of the original content was still there. And the objects in the exhibition are magnificent treasures with precious jewelry and coffins. Um, and, um, you know, they were found in a complex of nine tombs put together. And I suspect that had it not been discovered in 1939 during World War II, that this would have been, this discovery would have been uh, as much an event, as much an, as happening as the discovery of King Tut's tomb. Well, quickly then, moving on, um, most Egyptian gods have an animal form or one sacred to them, and prayers that you would make through these animals honored the gods while you're requesting their help and favor. And um, these were div you know, divine offerings because they represented the gods and kind of uh, this was the god who would then help you with your prayer and rituals. And so these animals were sacrificed to the gods and then they were uh, mummified the same way humans were mummified, and then they were buried in catacombs. And these are never before seen outside of Egypt because these are recent discoveries just made within the past couple of years. And you have, for example, the cat mummies, which were sacred to the god Bastis. And thousands of cats were mummified and offered to her. And then there are lion cubs, there's a mongoose, there's a crocodile, you'll see a wide variety of animals that were mummified and placed in the catacombs and dedicated to the different gods. Down below you see a, um, a box that has the dung beetle on it, and that is also um, uh, symbolic because as the dung beetle pushes a sphere of dung across the sand, so the sun was thought to push, be pushed by a, a beetle, a dung beetle, a heifer beetle, across the heavens. So um, that, you know, has hundreds of mummified dung beetles in it. So it turns out that Saqqara was a center for animal mummy burials, and further excavations, the archaeologists feel, might prove that it holds over, believe it or not, 15 million animal mummies. <laughs> well, this is one of the most beautiful things in the exhibition. It tells you something about the people who were the the builders and the artists of the Valley of the Kings, the royal tombs. And in a dramatically darkened gallery, you'll see this beautiful sarcophagus, which held the uh, coffin and the mummy of the artist Senegem. And it comes from a, a place called Deir el Medina, which was the home of workers who excavated in you know, the Valley of the Kings during the 18th and 20th dynasty. And um, Sinedrim was an exceptional artist. We know his name, we know where he, where he worked, and he decorated the tombs of both Ramses the Great and his father, Seti I. And on this sarcophagus, um, 
uh, in the exhibition, you can see photographically the walls of his tomb. So it's as if you walked into his tomb, and in the center of the tomb is his sarcophagus holding the coffin and the mummy. The mummy is not with us uh, in the exhibition, but it originally was there. And it is the most beautiful for uh, a non-royal. Not surprisingly, because on his days off, and we know which days they had off, he could work on his own tomb. Uh, <laughs> anyhow, um, looking at it, uh, you'll see on the left-hand side below, there is the, uh, the, the Anubis, who is taking care of, of Senegem's mummy in the coffin, and you'll see Senegem and his wife playing a game of Senet, which was a board game that um, kind of symbolizes your, the, the um, route that you would take to get to the afterworld. So um, it, it is a, um, a marvelous thing. And, and take a, a good long look at it, because it really is beautiful. I just put this on. Um, I thought maybe you'd like to see what the artists did in their spare time. Um, sometimes they practice some of the actual canonical imagery. Uh, and on, on these flakes of limestone, there was a lot of limestone because they dug into the, right into the limestone itself to create the tombs. And in this case, the artist has painted a cat standing upright and he's herding a group of geese. Very cute, very sweet, but it's a topsy-turvy world. I mean, you know, he's, he's holding a basket on a stick, and he, he has another stick on his, in his raised paw, and, you know, it's a caricature, isn't it? It's a, it's a, it reflects how the Egyptian artists, especially the artists at Deir El Medina, where they lived in a walled city, how they expressed their sentiments about absurdities and the faults of society. Um, and, uh, you know, this is, you know, usually a cat would run after geese, right? And in this case, he's herding it. And, um, you know, it's very interesting because it was a time, there was a period of political tensions and a problem with the economy. And the artisans of Deir El Medina went on strike a couple of times. That's the oldest strike that we know of in history because they hadn't received the food and uh, other supplies. That was their salary. So um, just thought I'd show you that because I love it. <laughs> As I say, Ramses had um, about 100 children and he outlived his wives, many of his wives, and uh, the first 12 of his sons. And here you have a statue of Meremta, his heir and 13th son. And this is in the exhibition as well. It was found in Meremta's um, Theban funerary temple. And he wears a striped Nemi's headcloth and with a uraeus. I mean, he's, he's the king, and it's good to be the king. <laughs> and. Um, it's an idealized image, obviously, because, you know, when he became the king, just think about it, he would have been in his 60s. Not as old as King Charles, uh, <laughs> but, but in his 60s. But we're looking at him as a young man. Ramses left great memorials to himself all over Egypt, and everything he did was bigger and better than any other the temples he erected, the statues he commissioned, the monuments he inscribed, and the funerary temple and royal tomb that he built all tell us something about Ramses the Great's life and the world he lived in. Um, and his legacy throughout history is so great that he forms the basis for Percy Bysshe Shelley's poem, about the transient nature of earthly power. And um, here you see, my name is Azimandius, king of kings. Look up on my works, ye mighty, and despair. This is where the poet is paraphrasing an inscription on the base of one of Ramses' sculptures. 
and, which originally stood in the Ramesseum, and you can see the drawing of the fallen sculpture. And, you know, it tells something about the transient nature of, of whatever you did on Earth. And, um, you know, it, it, um, he, he passes on, and for the Egyptians, he's still alive, he's still living as a god, with the gods, but um, we look upon what he has done, and, and we say, well, what really is left? Um, and, um, you know, we can look upon the, the, all of the great things that Ramses has left us, here, the Ramesseum, and uh, <laughs> uh, try to be so dramatic and I can't get the slide. Okay, let's try again. Space bar? There it is. Okay. The exhibition ends with this colossal statue of the king and it is a beautiful, it's, it's, it's installed high up as it would have been a colossal statue of Ramses the Great. Now other kings before and after Ramses erected colossal statues of themselves, but none are larger in size or greater in number than the ones commissioned by Ramses the Great. His sculpture on sacred temple grounds throughout Egypt and Nubia reminded his earthly might um, to all who came there, but also his closeness to the gods. They thought of him as a god, and as I say, when he died, he continued to be a god. And the exhibition ends with this statue, which, what can I say, he ruled almost as long as Elizabeth II. <laughs> so I've only been able to show you uh, just a glimpse of the glorious things in this exhibition. And, uh, you know, I invite you all to come and see it. It's there until February 12th. There is time to see it. And um, I think... I think the way it's installed really gives you a, a good context, a good understanding of Ramses and his time. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was a great um, tour, mini tour of uh, the De Young Museum's exhibition. And there were a lot of little tidbits in there, and I won't go into all of them. Uh, but uh, those of you who heard her mention the board game Senate, if you want to play the board game Senate, right outside the Rosicrucian Museum in, in San Jose, they have a big board, like those big chess boards outside ones, uh, where you can place on it, um, just in case you want to learn how to get to the afterlife. Um, <laughs> In addition, in addition to that, um, you, you found out how Ramses became a god. Now, our next speaker, uh, Rita Lucarelli, is an Egyptologist at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, she's a specialist in many areas of Egyptology, but also she did her research on the Book of the Dead, um, and she's going to be speaking to us about becoming a god. Um, I'm, we're not recommending this. Uh, <laughs> But we do have a different recommendation, which is if you come here looking for, you know, not becoming a god, but making some advertising money, if you could do a YouTube video of that cat herding the geese <laughs> that she likes so much, you could probably get several million views. Uh, so if you have any questions, um, we have cards and, and uh, pencils, so ask. So we'll have a Q&A at the end of Rita's uh, talk, and, and both Renee and Rita will answer questions. So I'll hand out those cards uh, while Rita begins to speak. Thank you very much for coming, Rita. Thank you. So Renee ended their uh, talk speaking indeed uh, about what is left of Ramses II and uh, 
uh, how those beautiful monuments speak of the king as, uh, okay, so, only, oh, okay, thank you. Um, and so how those uh, monuments uh, present the king as an eternal individual. Uh, not just human, but also divine. And indeed, all those beautiful statues, uh, jewelry, all, most of the, um, of the artifacts uh, that we found in Egypt come from tombs. And you probably know that um, we, the, the general idea about the ancient Egyptians is that they were obsessed by death. And this is why they filled the tombs with all these beautiful objects and artifacts, and they were painting their tombs, and they were having uh, um, a lot of uh, magical objects, what we call funerary equipment in the tomb. So I'll try to explain to you why they were doing that, and if we can really speak about an, obs an obsession for death, or maybe an obsession for life, because what they depict for their uh, uh, world um, in, the, in the afterlife, in, the, in what they call duat, is a word that we don't know how to translate. Generally, we translate it as uh, the nether world. So all what we find in the tomb actually speaks a lot about their uh, religious belief and religious practices also uh, during um, their life on earth. And um, this statue um, that um, you see here, and I don't know here, oh, so this is the pointer, where is it? Somewhere. Uh, okay. I lost it. Anyway, it's, it's also part of the exhibition uh, in the, the Young Museum, and it represents the king kneeling and offering a little shrine Okay, here, and this is the side view, but that shrine has um, three statues of three uh, divine figures, uh, the god Ra, the god Amun, the Eden god, and uh, a figure of a child. And we have in Egypt a lot of children, child gods. Um, children represented uh, uh, also as hieroglyph for uh, to be born, a mess. And actually, so the, this uh, shrine that uh, Ramses is offering is uh, a rebus of his name, uh, Rames Meriamun, uh, born uh, by Ra and loved by Amun. So with this emphasis on uh, the favor of, of the god for him. And by the way, the statue has been found in this cachette, a sort of uh, statues hoard uh, in Karnak, where they found 800 statues from all period, from the third millennium BC uh, to the Roman, uh, Greek Roman period. Um, and those were statues that were amassed there uh, later uh, during the pharaonic period. So we found these statues as well. And uh, here the, the king is very human, is uh, kneeling. Uh, we, we see here just uh, the, left, uh, uh, the left leg under his uh, body. Uh, the other leg is extended, so he's in a position of kneeling, offering to the gods, worshipping the gods. And indeed, if we think about what is religion for the ancient Egyptian, um, we realize that, first of all, there's not one word in, uh, anci in the ancient Egyptian language for religion, something that we can translate as religion. Religio is Latin. It's, uh, it's a different context than... Uh, um, what the Egyptians talked it was religion, religion. and uh, the expression that m um, says more about what religion was for there was uh, iret hihet, doing things. What were these things? Those were rituals, so doing ritual things, offering to the gods, taking care of their sacred places and of their deceased. That was religion. So it's, it was really more an action than just a belief. And we see that all the time in the representations in tombs, uh, on, 
objects in tombs, but also in temples, in, uh, and not only at the royal level, but also at the non-royal royal level. And um, indeed, as uh, George said, my specialty is to work with uh, uh, magical text and um, illustrations taken from the so-called ancient Egyptian uh, Book of the Dead. Oh, so I didn't change. This is... Okay, oh, this one, yeah. Uh, and this is an example, it's a detail from a papyrus from the Book of the Dead. In those papyri, um, we always seen the deceased. Here is this uh, uh, beautiful woman that again is kneeling, similar to what uh, Ramses was doing, in front of divine figure. In this case, we see a baboon. The baboon is a sacred animal. Uh, sacred to the god Thoth, the god of writing, but also uh, the baboon symbolized the worship uh, towards the sun god. Baboons were, were uh, uh, worshipping uh, the sun, and they, we will see more baboons later. In this case, this baboon is uh, also worshipping uh, a solar disk, and inside uh, the solar disk there is uh, an amuletic uh, um, figure, the, the Eye of Horus, that uh, you've seen also already on, the, on this beautiful uh, uh, bracelet that uh, René showed to you. And um, those symbols of protection, those amuletic figures, are also everywhere on uh, those objects, in tombs, in papyri, but also on tomb walls, because protection was a key concept for uh, life after death for the ancient Egyptians. And uh, their idea of death was in, in, indeed a new beginning. I, I always like to say death is actually a new beginning, is a new life for the ancient Egyptians. And their focus wasn't just uh, about uh, um, reaching a spiritual life, in, as, as we can think about the life of the soul after death, leaving the body and the body decomposing while the soul will survive. Actually, when we look at the Egyptian uh, objects and images, we can see how their focus was also on the body. And um, this focus on the body um, uh, uh, needs, uh, also shows that the, the concept of uh, bodily sustenance, and uh, it was very important. So the body needs to be intact, and this explains, of course, mummification. Um, and it has to be intact and protected in order for the spiritual parts of the deceased to transform into a god. And this is why my title, be, title Becoming a God, which is also an expression Heper nature in ancient Egyptians that you find in many uh, magical texts. Um, that there is uh, the, this wish to be transformed in some, something else, not only, again, at the royal level, so not only Ramses was going to be a god, but a, each individual who could access this sacred knowledge. And so um, we, we, of course, those papyri belong always to the elite of the society, but we found also um, artifacts and uh, other proof that those beliefs were shared also with the common people. Only they, they had no means to, to really have those beautifully uh, illustrated papyri. Um, and so uh, let's look first of all at the bodily dimension in the, the ancient Egyptian religious beliefs and uh, uh, how the, the body uh, moved in the netherworld. And uh, I always like to start from language because language really helps a lot to understand uh, the, um, uh, the way of thinking, right, of the ancient people. And so the Egyptians had two words to define the, the body. One is um, chat, that you see represented here oh. On, uh, uh, with these hieroglyphs of a fish. And so chat is the corpse. The corpse, though, is not in, seen as just being in the tomb, the corpse can also descend in the underworld or go in the netherworld. So it's a, it can move as well. There is another word which is sah, 
And uh, that, uh, that is the real mummified body, so the, the corpse after mummification. And it's interesting that the same word is, use, is used in some text to um, indicate uh, someone who is worthy, or um, in certain translations even use the word aristocrat, uh, because indeed to be mummified uh, was already a privilege. And uh, indeed, not everyone could afford mummifications. We know, though, that there were also natural ways to uh, mummify, mummify bodies. So we found also um, poorer uh, ma uh, mummified bodies that, anyway, um, the Egyptians believed could access the netherworld. And uh, the text that you see on the screen is um, um, an ancient uh, uh, Egyptian religious text uh, that say that one shall cut off a foreleg for your car uh, and a hurt for your mummy. May your bus send, may your corpse descend. What that means, the foreleg is the typical offering to the gods or to the dead. And so um, the, the ka, we will see what the ka and the ba are exactly, uh, but it's interesting how um, the mummified body itself, uh, the, and so not the spiritual part of the individual, but the mummified part needs to be sustained by offerings. And um, we will see the ba is um, this human-headed bird, we will see it in a minute. But the corpse, you see, descend. So the, corp, the corpse entered the netherworld. Uh, the corpse of, of, human, of humankind, but of human uh, individual, but also the corpse of the gods. And we see this in uh, um, these amazing illustrations, very enigmatic as well, a bit esoteric, I will say, of the so-called books of the netherworld. And I will show you some more uh, pictures from the so-called books of the netherworld uh, that were decorating uh, uh, royal tombs, but were used also later for papyri of non-royal individuals. And um, in this, in particular, so-called book of caverns, uh, we see indeed the, the mummified body of Osiris in the, in the shrine here, and Osiris was the mummy par excellence, the, the, the symbol of the mummified body and of the person that dies and then is reborn. Um, and uh, around Osiris, we see those ovals, which are caverns, we know it from the text. Inside the caverns, we find all those um, um, corpse, they are de defined in the text as corpse, of deities. And it, it looks always when we see these corpse that they were all kind of isolated. Uh, this isolation and this um, idea of death as isolation and uh, separation is not to be seen as something negative. Uh, isolation was also sort of synonym of protection. So by encircling a body, you isolate it, you protect it. It's the same conception of having uh, temples with walls around to, in order to isolate and protect the ritual, sacred space. And, and so death as bodily separation and isolation is a concept that you really see in images and text a lot in, uh, in tombs, in uh, uh, religious and magical text. And Ian Asman, a very popular, uh, famous uh, and great inspiration for Egyptologists, uh, he's an Egyptologist and an, uh, an historian. Um, he, uh, he actually talked a lot um, uh, about this, this concept. Um, and by the way, this nice snake on the side here is a guardian, and uh, snakes were very much represented in those uh, uh, books of the netherworld as uh, tonic creatures, creatures of, of the earth, and they were acting indeed as guardians of those regions where the bodies of the gods and of the deceased were uh, leaving and starting a journey. And we will return on the concept of the journey soon. Um, 
so as I say, the, the idea of the mummified body being protected uh, is very present, and this is uh, a beautiful scene from the tomb of Nefertari, the great wife of Ramses II, and one of the most beautiful tombs that we have in the Valley of the Queen, near the Valley of the, uh, of the Kings uh, in Luxor. And uh, indeed, as René uh, mentioned, we don't have uh, the, the tomb of Ramses II um, is not in, it's, it's not been preserved uh, uh, properly because of the terrain conditions, uh, but was, um, was decorated very similarly to uh, the, the, the tombs I, I'm going to show you, in particular the one of uh, Nefertari. And so uh, what we see here again is uh, a sort of isolated but protected mummified body of Osiris again, um, and uh, the two goddesses, uh, ne Nef Nefti and uh, Isis, sister and wife, uh, two sisters of Osiris, but uh, Isis being also the wife of Osiris, protecting the body in a form of, uh, uh, of an oak. And um, those manifestations of gods as animals of hybrid body uh, are very common as well. So uh, God could manifest entirely human. In this case, we have the example of uh, the god uh, Nun. We recognize it because of the blue body, Nun was the primordial waters and uh, is uh, indeed the primordial god ap appearing in many myths. And we have uh, um, um, a phoenix bird, also very sacred birds, a lion here that, well, this is uh, the, the scene the, um, that accompany another Book of the Dead spell, chapter 17 of the Book of the Dead, where uh, the all uh, uh, mysteries of Osiris are uh, uh, illustrated and mentioned. And so there is a series of gods, and the, the lion is one of them, represented, uh, representing also the concept of time, yesterday and today. Um, so speaking about again, bodies, mummified bodies, bodies of the gods. Uh, we have a lot of hybrid bodies as well in the netherworld. They are all protectors, and um, I like to call them guardians. Um, in uh, ancient Egyptians, uh, they appear as groups of uh, um, non-individualized, not, not much individualized guardians uh, with uh, common names like watchers or murderers or wanderers or squatting one and I think the squatting ones, ones could be this one on this sarcophagus uh, in the upper register. You see they, they seems like a bit squatting but also in this detail from a later coffin uh, they are still sitting or squatting and they have animal head and mummified body. And so those were the agents of protection. They have um, also epithets or sort of names uh, sometimes attached to them that individualize them better, especially in the Book of the Dead. And those are some of the names, as you can see, um, uh, face downwards, no, numerous of shapes, or the hearer, said of voice, one who stretch out his brow, or one with vigilant face, the radiant one. So the names always refer in the end to a part of their bodies. And you see them represented here again with those mummified bodies and either some kind of um, human head or uh, uh, animal head. Animals are always uh, some uh, lions or uh, uh, vultures. Um, um, well, there are different, different kind of uh, wild animals, let's say, in this uh, case, I think this is an hare. It's not always too easy uh, recognize them, uh, to recognize them. And as you can see here, they hold uh, knives. Those, the, the attribute of the knife is an attribute of, pr of uh, protection. They can also um, implicitly be dangerous because if you don't know how to approach them, if you don't know the magical spell that uh, is generally inscribed near the, their uh, their image, you cannot enter the regions that they, um, they watch, that they guard. And those regions indeed are uh, distinguished by gates. 
they generally sit in the gates. And those guardians um, can be called demons, not in the pejorative sense of the term, not a demon com connected to Satan or the devil, but uh, in the Greek sense as daimon, as a spirit that can be benevolent or malevol malevolent. Um, indeed, uh, in, in ancient Egypt, there weren't uh, there, wa there, wa there, there was not a real dichotomy between uh, evil and good, but the two uh, aspects can, can go together. So in this case, the guardians indeed were ambiguous beings that the deceased wanted to use for uh, protecting his coffin, his tomb, or uh, um, that he has to um, meet in the netherworld. And uh, in this papyrus of the Book of the Dead, as you can see, they are only sketched, but we have also very col colorful, beautiful guardians. Um, like uh, one of my favorites is actually this uh, female lioness uh, guardian uh, um, that comes, actually is, um, is one of those guardians of the so-called spell 144 of the Book of the Dead. Uh, this spell is also illustrated in the tomb of Nefertari, and so maybe you recognize uh, uh, here. Okay, well, this one, right? Yeah. yeah, together in a triad. A lot of times those guardian appears in triad, in groups of three. So here we see one with a ram head and a human one, and you see what, what you see... Um, Oh, what you see here is uh, is is one of those gates that the deceased has to enter, and before entering, has to speak with the, he has to he or she have to speak with the guardians, and so those. Uh, uh, images uh, are uh, depicted in royal tombs, but also in non-royal tombs. And so the, the Book of the Dead, uh, or the books of the netherworlds, uh, weren't only made uh, for uh, uh, the benefit of uh, royal people. Um, although we will see at the very beginning, uh, we found uh, those texts only attested in royal tombs, but later they become more popular. Um, and another piece from the exhibition, uh, one of my favorites as well, is uh, this relief fragment uh, representing deities protecting the pharaoh. Where is the pharaoh here? Because we see on the right, uh, I wish this pointer would, uh, I'm really clumsy with this. Yeah, okay. So uh, you see here, Anubis, well, maybe I'll just move. So Anubis, a very famous god of the dead, taking care of uh, mummification. And uh, uh, the female goddess with the horns and the solar disk could be Hathor, but we see on the text she's Aset Weret, Nechermut, the um, great Isis, uh, mother of the gods. So this is Isis. And then a mummified figure representing Osiris, but maybe also the pharaoh. But the, the fact that Ramses II is there uh, is clear from the long cartouche um, inside which we see the uh, throne name and um, uh, the bird name of Ramses. So a long cartouche and the name represents indeed the person. So having the name in between the figures of the gods is like actually being there. Uh, and so, again, here we see how those Necheru, that's the uh, Egyptian word to define the gods, were protecting not only the dead, but also the, the dead pharaoh. Um, and so th this is why in the tombs we uh, find uh, an, um, a lot of, uh, of, of images where the pharaoh, the queen, are in the presence of the gods. Um, and this is again from the tomb of Nefertari. Oh, did it change there? Okay, right. Yeah, so uh, the beautiful queen, as you can see, the, the uh, headrest is uh, the, in, 
in the shape of a vulture, it's a symbol of royalty. And she's here in front of Thoth. Thoth is the god of writing. Um, but this, this scene really refers to a specific uh, spell of the Book of the Dead, so-called spell 94. We give numbers. The Egyptians didn't give numbers, but because we have to catalog uh, as scholars, we we use these numbers. So spell 94 is um, entitled the formula for requesting the writing palette and water well for thought. And you see here the water well and the palette, thought, god of writing in front of the queen. And this cute frog is actually a symbol of eternity. The frog in ancient Egypt was seen also um, as divine and symbol of eternity. Um, but this scene also um, really uh, symbolized the fact that uh, uh, sacred knowledge um, comes from the gods. Gods are the authors of the text. So we never find texts or images signed by the, uh, by the uh, Egyptian artist, but uh, we always have reference to the fact that this these words were sacred words. So in order to, um, to gain this knowledge, one has to be close to the gods. And this is why religion was so important, because even just the writing, not only religious writing, came from the gods. And so you, you have to be close to the gods in order to access any form of knowledge. Um, and another uh, important concept, uh, René also mentioned it, uh, um, is the concept of Maat. Maat is a goddess, beautiful goddess, as you can see, this winged co goddess, uh, here again, from the tomb of Nefertari. Um, she, uh, she's also the, um, the symbol of the concept of truth or justice, or with another expression, whatever is right, what is right, which is not the same, what was right in ancient Egypt is not the same of what is right today, right? So I, I like this to this translation, math as what is right for the ancient Egyptians. And math was not only important in life on earth, but also in, in the life in the netherworld. And that's why we have a lot of images with uh, math being there, again, as a protected deity, but at the same time, um, with the need to, to respect Matt in the netherworld. And I'll show you another picture later. Um, and here are other images uh, of um, um, the same period uh, of Ramses II. That's uh, Ramses I here, uh, who has a um, wonderfully decorated tomb in King Valley 16, where again you see here uh, the, the pharaoh who is um, uh, offering, uh, again, doing things, so religion as uh, performance, uh, is offering to a god with a beetle head. And the beetle is also a symbol of becoming, of transformation. And this is indeed an, an image of the sun god uh, as Capri, the god of transformation. Uh, the other three gods in this uh, nice pose on the back are the so-called soul, is a translation, but is actually bow of ne and uh, pe and nechen, two ancient cultic plays, and so gods that follow always the um, the deceased king um, when approaching other main gods. You, you can see it in, in these other scenes here, the pharaoh, Epli, uh, holding hands uh, with the series of very important gods, Horus, the falcon god, son of Osiris. Um, Atum, we know all that, of course, from the name. Atum is another um, form of the sun god, is the, uh, the creator uh, sun god. And uh, here we see uh, Hathor. And um, they are approaching Osiris, uh, the Lord of the Dead, and this little figure is actually a priest. And we, recon we recognize priests because of the leopard skin that they wear. So in always this, this idea of having uh, 
um, the, the, the dead in the company of the gods, because indeed, in the end, what he wants to be is a god himself. So it's important to, to always stay close with the gods. And that's why we, we find these decorations in uh, tombs. Um, and um, here are another beautiful images, and I'll give, I'll give credits for all these beautiful pictures uh, in a moment, but um, you see here part of the sarcophagus, anthropoid sarcophagus of Ramses VI in his tomb, that's another beautifully uh, illustrated tomb with uh, uh, figures uh, protecting almost the three-dimensional sarcophagus. This was a great um, big stone sarcophagus who was smashed in pieces, but thanks to a project, project supported by actually the American Research Center in Egypt, um, of which I'm, I'm part, um, it was then uh, recomposed and is now in the tomb. It was smashed because they were looking for the gold mask and uh, the other coffins inside it. But um, even when you enter an Egyptian tomb, you really have this feeling of being protected by uh, from all these figures around you. And uh, so the coffin, the, the body of the king in the middle, protected by the figures, were, were, was considered uh, as um, a very powerful uh, mean in order to survive uh, in the other world. And so it, it, it was no, um, for them it wasn't important that those tombs were closed and nobody would look at this beautiful art because the, the meaning of uh, the function of this art was just magical. So there was not the idea of, oh, somebody has to, to see how, what a beautiful piece of art I, I did in the tomb. The tomb should have been closed. Of course, they've been open pretty soon already in antiquity. And so speaking about uh, um, the conception of uh, the deceased person, another important um, idea is uh, uh, that one of the Ka, the life force. It's a, the Ka is also hieroglyph of the ends, standing ends, again in uh, action, in a performance for worshipping. And we found statues of Ka, like uh, this very famous one in wood, uh, from uh, a previous king, uh, uh, Harawi Bra, 13 dynasties, you could see much uh, earlier than the time of Ramses. But uh, recently, in 2019, they just uh, uh, discovered this beautiful uh, pink granite uh, statue of the Ka of Ramses II. So uh, any disease must have a Ka because the Ka was the life force and the light source. It was a sort also of double of the deceased, and those statues were uh, placed at the, at the entrance of the tomb where the offerings were brought. So the ka was the part of the dead the, uh, who should receive the offerings. And these images of the dead uh, receiving offering uh, are uh, um, also very popular. This is another piece uh, uh, painted the line and clothes of Senefer that you can uh, uh, now also see um, Ade de Young. And so the image of the, the deceased looking like actually much lively man. So again, the, the body sustained by the offerings on the offering, uh, um, on the offering uh, uh, table. <clears throat> The other uh, important p um, part of the disease was the ba, uh, I already mentioned, uh, generally translated as soul, but I don't like to translate it as soul because indeed it's a different conception. The ba as a body, this body is always very well characterized because it's a bird with the head of the deceased. And you can see uh, they are very careful to make sure that they resemble each other. So here is the deceased in front of his ba. We even have a text from ancient Egypt, it's called the dialogue of a man with his ba, where we have a man trying to convince the ba that actually life is no good and he wants to die. Uh, and it's, it's actually considered one of the most ancient texts about um, um, thinking about suicide. And we don't know how it ends the text, but the Ba is actively 
talking with the, with the man and saying how he should enjoy life on earth. And uh, it's a beautiful uh, text actually to, to read a piece of literature from ancient Egypt. And of course, I wanted to show you the beautiful Ba of Queen Nefertari. As you can see, very, uh, it's the same face of the queen that here is indeed playing a senate. Uh, the, the chess game uh, in ancient Egypt represented, uh, again, this is a vignette from the Book of the Dead uh, of spell uh, uh, 17, playing senate. Senate means passing. So playing senate is trying to pass uh, through the netherworld. And here the Ba is on top of the of the tomb because the ba was the element of the person who could leave the tomb go around uh, in the world of the livings but he always has to go back uh, and reunite to the body so it cannot just leave uh, and uh, have fun forever on earth it needs to go back to the tomb and uh, apparently from the images it looks he was always doing that and we have also ba of the gods. Uh, in this case, we see another of these books of the netherworld, a very interesting one uh, uh, from the tomb of Ramses the Sixth, the, the Book of Caverns. And you see here an etiphallic form of Osiris with this little bird on, the her on, on his head. And so this is actually the baldo. It doesn't have the face of Osiris. And again, you see here Osiris uh, that is approaching another uh, region of the netherworld. Uh, there is a snake, another guardian snake, uh, uh, this oval representing a sarcophagi or uh, caverns. Uh, and here, probably you, you may ask yourself, what about these bodies? As you can see, they, they have no head, they are decapitated, and their arms are tied behind their back. And those are, this is the iconography indeed of the, of the captive uh, that we have seen also um, in uh, some of the pieces of um, uh, René's presentations. But this iconography was also uh, then associated to the damned, the damned uh, people, those who don't pass the final judgment and cannot become gods. They are punished forever, and uh, they are represented in this sort of Egyptian hell, in this calderon, in what is called in the text uh, the, pla the uh, place of annihilation. And you see this place has hands, and those hands are holding the calderon. So it's, this is better than Dante's uh, <laughs> Divina Commedia, I guess. <laughs> Um, finally, another important part of the person appearing um, in uh, funerary composition is the Ak. Uh, Ak uh, is a word in ancient Egyptian uh, that means to be effective. And indeed, uh, the Ak is the effective spirit, is the, also the transfigured spirit. After becoming a god, you become an Ak. And ancestors are considered Aku as well. So we have those beautiful um stila called uh, uh Akeniker stila the 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 stila of the um uh, the very worthy uh, ak the ak here is really the deceased ancestor uh, so um those person those parts of the person ba ka ak occurs in uh, uh, tomb, papyri decorations, uh, uh, within a narrative of a journey, the journey through those regions of the netherworld. And indeed, the real uh, title of um, the Book of the Dead, the Book of the Dead is what Egyptologists called this collection of spells. The first um, uh, um, title was indeed the German totem book, and then became uh, known as Book of the Dead, but in, uh, the, the Egyptians call it Peretem Heru, going out by day or going out in the light. And so in these images, we always see the deceased in form of Ba or as a human uh, uh, being coming out of the tomb and then moving back, so starting this journey. 
um, when this journey, when we see this idea, this belief in the journey, very early, already in pre-dynastic period, before having even text attested, in the burials of the so-called Nakada period, this is a reconstruction, we can see the human body surrounded by um, vase, and many of them are decorated. And this, decora this is the decoration of the, the image of a boat. So the idea of uh, traveling by boat in a journey uh, and, and those boats don't only go on water, but also in the sky, is present even before writing started. So we, we are talking here about 3600 BC. Uh, then, uh, starting from uh, uh, a bit later, 3000 BC, we start to have some text in the pyramids of the king, and uh, texts like, indeed, uh, Hail to you, ostrich, which is on the bank of the winding waterway, open my way that I may pass. This sort of text re um, stayed the same until the first millennium BC and later. Open the way, let me pass. It's like the, the real obsession of the ancient Egyptians was not about death, but about being able to move in the netherworld. And so the, the first um, texts are um, uh, carved uh, in the burial chamber of the um, uh, kings of the so-called Old Kingdom. So we are around 2400 BC. You see beautifully carved, also uh, colored. And here you see the cartouche, cartouche of Unis, uh, that is um, a king of the uh, fifth dynasty, the first one with the text engraved in the tomb. And this is when we say, well, those texts were only for the kings, but probably they were also used by non-royal persons, only not inscribed in uh, those beautiful tombs. Later on in the second millennium BC, the same texts are edited and copied on coffins. Um, and those are... Uh, those wooden coffin completely inscribed, especially inside, why inside and not more inside than outside. Outside there were just line of text with offering formulas, but inside there were all the spells. So why inside? Because the, the, the deceased will wake up probably and look around and start to have this sacred knowledge to read around, know how to move in the netherworld. And indeed, uh, this is the period also when we have the first ma maps of the netherworld, uh, the so-called Book of the Two Ways, inscribed on the bottom or inside those wooden coffins, rectangular coffins. Uh, you can see, maybe you can see here why it's called the Book of the Two Ways. Uh, there are many mainly two different way, uh, ways made of water and fire through which the deceased has to go during this journey and uh, recognizing all the divine creatures he meets uh, during the journey. And so those rectangular coffins are uh, found also later, although uh, later on at the time of Ramses, the coffins were mostly anthropoid, but there was a system of nest coffins. So the anthropoid coffins in the end were placed uh, uh, inside a, a bigger outer coffin that could be uh, rectangular coffins, like the coffin of Senegem that you have already seen. And of course, I wanted to show you the detail of the bath of Sen uh, Senegem and his, uh, his wife, uh, which are really beautiful. And as René said, it's, uh, it's amazing how this uh, coffin has been uh, um, placed now in the exhibition of Ramses the Great because the old tomb is uh, reconstructed and uh, once you're there you can see how if you look at the images of the outer coffins which are again spells of the Book of the Dead you'll see that some of them are the same from the tomb wall. Uh, so some of the images, we don't know if it was Senegem who, who chose those, we think so because he was an artisan and so he was uh, himself decorating tombs. Some of, of those scenes he talked were probably very important and so wanted to have them both on tomb walls and on coffins. And another beautiful scene uh, from this tomb uh, here in a facsimile is uh, the one of the so-called Egyptian paradise. We have seen a sort of hell, but there was also paradise. And this looked as uh, a very abundant place uh, where the deceased, though, 
and his wife very often, like in the case of Senegem, were uh, working. And why you would work in the netherworld, like, like uh, um, here uh, occupied, as you see, in uh, uh, field work in the, in, with grain uh, um, uh, moving uh, here, bringing, yeah, the cattles, and you can see then also, anyway, honoring the gods. Uh, why doing that? Well, it was uh, uh, just um, a way to express the fact that life in the netherworld was actually the same as on Earth, and actually the wish was for having even a, a wealthier life than on Earth. And working in the field, it means that you, you have those fields, right? So you're, you're a rich person in the netherworld. Uh, again, uh, um, going back to the books of the netherworld, uh, I wanted to show you this image from uh, actually a shrine. So we have seen papyri, tomb walls, but even uh, those shrines of uh, important kings. And in this case, this is the shrine of Tutankhamun were decorated uh, with um, uh, very uh, magical protective images. And so you see here this uh, very, oh, didn't keeps okay this very peculiar one where you see again this mummified body uh, with what is uh, the oldest uh, representation of the Ouroboros, the encircling uh, snake representing beginning and end of time um, and those are really enigmatic pictures because the text doesn't say much about it. So what we think is in, indeed that this was uh, a union of actually the, the sun and um, Osiris, uh, uh, meaning rebirth. And you see also those images uh, of gods who are with the rope, uh, kind of extracting another solar disk. Uh, with the ram-headed bird with human hands inside. So there's a lot there for creativity and there have been so many interpretations also of these images. Um, and I think they, they, there will be many more because uh, they, they were left ambiguous for a purpose, I think. And because in, in ancient Egyptian religions, they weren't really st strong concepts about uh, um, what is good or what is bad, what is uh, um, uh, a symbol of death or life, but everything was uh, connected in many different ways. So they wanted to leave also some room for interpretations. And uh, to conclude, uh, the Amduat, that means uh, what is in the Duat, what is in the netherworld, is another important composition. Um, attested in uh, royal tombs and then non royal papyri uh, in the Ramesid period. And uh, the, um, this composition is divided in 12 hours, 12 hours of the night, uh, illustrating uh, the, um, the journey of the sun god, considering the, the royal uh, king, uh, the, the sea king being the sun god as well. And so here you will see. The sun god always represented here in one boat and with an encircling uh, in, in a shrine, and here as a scarab, as a beetle again. And all those gods, they were all inhabitants of the netherworld. There is a, a, a long series of uh, hybrid bodies. You see here we have Stila with the human head. Those were all following the journey of the sunboat and they were living there. So the netherworld was highly populated. They must have had a house issue as well, like in the <laughs> Bay Area. <laughs> I guess uh, less expensive than here, but uh, <laughs> you can see here more of those bodies following uh, in a detail from the second hour. The second hour is especially um, a watery region. So we have, we have all this uh, uh, water going around and uh, more uh, protective deities, sketches um, with uh, some text on it saying about the names also here in captions. And this to these are tomb walls, but they are treated almost like if they are a papyrus. You can see it especially from, uh, um, no, 
Okay, this part, you see, this is still a tomb wall, but looks like a papyrus, and probably they had the papyrus, they were copying from the papyrus, writing all this text, explaining what was going on in the netherworld. And so in the end, I don't have time to show you all the hours, uh, but uh, the 12 hours is uh, uh, the, re the, the, way, the, the moment in which the solar boat goes out from the underworld and goes back in the sky, so after having uh, met with the body of Osiris. Okay? And this we find it also on uh, uh, sarcophagi. And uh, I really have to credit for most of these beautiful photos, this book, Bilder den Usterblichkeit, uh, German publication uh, cured by Zahia Was with the photos of uh, an Italian photographer, Sandro Vannini, who spent, uh, spent um, many years taking beautiful pictures in the Valley of the, Queen, of the Queens and uh, of Kings, of the Kings. And you can find uh, a lot of his photos also on, uh, on internet, on Flickr, for instance. And uh, if you want to look at more of those images, um, I have um, a digital project uh, uh, with the uh, Hearst Museum uh, of Anthropology at UC Berkeley. And indeed, we have an Egyptian collection too, only we don't have space for, um, uh, no, uh, we don't have gallery space. So with this project, I'm digitizing uh, coffins uh, decorated with Book of the Dead and um, spells and images. And so if you want to have a look, self-promotion here, you can go on the website and look at more images. Uh, what you have seen of those beautiful tomb images are also on later coffins from the first millennium BC. What, what website? Oh, uh, so, oh, sorry, it keeps... Uh, <laughs> it was this. So this is one of the coffins I digitized. Uh, actually, we did also a couple of coffins from the Legion of Honor, and they are online, and you can um, uh, flip around the 3D model, look around all these beautiful images, again, of God's protection of the deceased. And uh, yeah, with this, I thank you for your attention. I'm sorry if I hope I didn't take too much time. I didn't show the one that I'm going to start with a couple of questions that came into us from our live stream audience. About 100 people watch this at the same time. Cool. Online. So uh, we have a question from <laughs> Kip Crana, who we all know here. Uh, how did the Egyptian concept of the underworld compare with the Western idea of paradise? Was the underworld a place of perpetual happiness? <laughs> Yes, uh, so it, it, it was if you've been good on earth and uh, pass the judgment and indeed become an ark, become a transfigured spirit, um, then definitely you will end up in this field of offerings that was a sort of paradise. But otherwise, you, if you, you could be damned forever. So there was this other concept, the moot. The moot is the... Um, a sort of, uh, well, it's a pity Halloween is gone already, but a sort of <laughs> the, the, the evil dead, the restless dead, uh, moot were also considered um, really dangerous on earth. They could come back and uh, hurt you like sort of ghost, but they are represented in those scenes of a sort of hellish scenes in which they are punished and they are punished forever and there are those gods and guardians who keep punishing them by cutting their head, uh, burning them in fire, drawing them in water, really, really cruel stuff that was going on in the Egyptian hell. Um, yes, I, I, I just uh, wanted to add that uh, many of you know the scene in the Hall of Judgment where the heart is weighed against the feather of truth, the feather of mat. We talked about mat. And if your heart was heavy with your evil deeds, then it would be thrown to a, the, a, a demon or destroyer, or what was he called? The, the, the devourer of the, the devourer dead. The devourer of the dead. And, and, and then he would, he would, a person would be dead forever. However, 
if your heart was light with good deeds, then you could proceed. And it, 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 it's a wonderful image because, you know, you've got the balance scale, you've got the concept of Mott, and you have the heart. And, and you know, when, when people were mummified, they didn't know where personality came from, they didn't know um, your memory, uh, what you did. They thought it was the heart, you know, they threw away whatever they found in the, in the skull as just some kind of uh, lining, <laughs> something. <laughs> so, so that way, uh, it was your heart that would tell if you've been good. And of course, one way to make sure you were told what was good is you had a heart scarab that would say something like, oh, my heart, do not speak against me in the hall of judgment. <laughs> uh, so you, you were protected in one way or another. Yeah, in, in this papyri, if I may add, um, the poor devourer of the dead, Amemet, which was this composite monster um, with the body of a lion, a hippo, uh, will stay hungry forever because all those deceased, of course, passed the judgment. They had uh, this negative confession in which they say, I did not commit this and that, I did not lie, I did not steal, and... They were always passing the judgment, so I'm always I always feel sad for Amemet, the devourer, yeah. mm -hmm. that could never devour any hurt. <laughs> no. <laughs> Thanks. So here's one for Renee. The exhibit at the De Young is excellent. Thank you for bringing it to San Francisco. How many have been there? I, we'll, we'll, we'll ask. We'll, we'll we'll cheer it on. It's really fantastic. And then the question is. How did you arrange to get it here instead of it ah. going to another city? Ah. Well, um, you know, I mentioned that the exhibition in, in Egypt was organized by Zahi Hawass. You all know him, uh, a very fine archaeologist. Uh, he's on National Geographic, Discovery Channel. Uh, he's very sure of himself. He's a great self-promoter. And, and I think it was the New Yorker magazine who referred to him as Zahi the Great. <laughs> so um, he, because of his high status in Egypt, he was able to secure these wonderful treasures that came. Um, and, um, you know, once these treasures go back to Egypt, I have to tell you, I don't think you will see them in our lifetime. Um, they are, they'll go back to the museums. The Great Egyptian Museum is being um, put together right now and, and treasures are being put in there. Other museums as well are being redesigned re, uh, and, and updated. So um, this was a kind of once in a lifetime experience. Uh, I knew that it was the right thing to do. How did I hear about the exhibition? This is funny. There's a company that worked with Zahi to organize it in um, America and Europe, uh, and actually it's going to Japan as well. But um, they said to him, where in America would you like it to go? And I've worked with Zahi on a number of projects throughout the years. I've known him since we were both students. And he said, call Renee. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> so, yeah. But the, but the trick was, you know, I presented it to my director. And, and you know, I'm, I've told you there are a number of different aspects of the exhibition images of, of uh, Ramses the Great, things that relate to Ramses the Great, but then jewelry before and after him, and other things that, uh, like, like the animal mummies. And my director said, as long as you can make it coherent, as long as you continue you know, to take this exhibition and make it right for our visitors who are far more sophisticated uh, than in other cities, then no, it's true. It's true. I, you know, <laughs> lots of lo I brought you lots of Egyptian exhibitions. So, you know, it, it, really, San Francisco knows a lot more. It, it opened in Houston, Texas, and I had the opportunity to see it there. And then 
reconstituted it for San Francisco. So, you know, it, it, um, it now reads very well as I've presented it for you. So, <laughs> director said, fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there's a very detailed question that's kind of interesting. How did Egyptians know about baboons? I think of them as being sub-Saharan deep in the jungles, but obviously it's part of their iconography, so they must have known about them. So yeah. does anybody know? Do you know how they know about them? Yeah. There were baboons in Egypt um, mm -hmm. um, be because, well, uh, when there was also a different climate, and so that's why we, we find... Uh, uh, representations of animals that you don't find in Egypt now, like baboons or lions or elephants. Mm -hmm. um, so they, they basically, when uh, 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 Egypt um, was um, uh, had, had more, f more green, let's say, as mm -hmm. well than now, they, those animals uh, were brought also from the south, so from Nubia, uh, the, Today, uh, today Sudan, and they were brought then also to um, northern Egypt. That's why they were there. Uh, no. And that's how Hannibal got his elephants too. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, another one from our online audience. This one's from Jongmin Lee. Did Ramses II try to popularize religion and mystery than the mystery of Osiris among common people? Do you think he was a good king to the common people? Oh, that's a good question. Was he a good king for the common people? I think probably that that's true. Um, you know, he considered himself the, the, the leader of all of the cults of Egypt um, as, as the religious uh, person um, that all would look to. And he set precedents for other people for the common people as well. And they would see him making the offerings and they would see him uh, creating these temples to the gods and, and fixing other temples that had fallen into ruin so that the gods could rule effectively. I think in that way, you know, they would follow him and um, understand what it meant to worship the gods in the proper way. I think so. Mm -hmm. Um, There's a related question, I'll, uh, so I'm going to read that one too. Uh, do you think the fact that the common people could access the gods means that the pharaohs and elites tried to teach their religious knowledge to people so that they could communicate with them? So did they, did they you know, we, we know about how religion operates here. You said basically uh, it's a ritual. It was a ritual in ancient Egypt, a ritual for different purposes. Mm -hmm. So were they... Were the poor people tried to be brought into those rituals in any way, or or were they ignored? Yeah, that, I think that's a. Yeah, I mean, um, it wasn't really the king teaching the people, but uh, were the priests mm -hmm. in the temple were uh, uh, controlling, let's say, the religious life and connected to, of course, politics as well. So. Um, the, those priests uh, were in contact uh, not just with the king but also with the people and we, we used to call personal piety of popular religion uh, that um, um, the, the sort of religious practices uh, that do not happen in the temple but in the household and we have found especially in Deran Medina uh, private cults so cults of uh, uh, house cults of uh, certain deities uh, uh, who do not have temples. So uh, those were cults not to Osiris, Hat or Anubis, but to uh, deities like Bess, a dwarf god with, who was considered a very strong protector, especially for uh, pregnant women, or um, uh, Mesegeret, the, the, the cobra goddess, uh, uh, of the desert uh, was considered also a very protective goddess. So there were, uh, um, there was another dimension to the cult, to the religious life that did not really go through the king, but was connected to the temple and to uh, the priestly environment. So priests were actually very important for uh, life in ancient Egypt in general. You know, one thing I, I just wanted to um, expand upon, a, 
I talked about, we both talked about Sinejem and Dir El Medina, and the reason why we know so much about what life was like. I mean, you, you've got discoveries, you know, within this walled city of the actual builders and and uh, painters and artisans of of the royal tombs um, is because there are so many texts that they left. And these texts describe a lot of what their life was like. And uh, in fact, not only how they lived, how they worked, and how they worshipped. And uh, it really turns out to be a, a miraculous way to understand uh, the people. I, I wouldn't necessarily call them common people because they were an elite group, um, but it does teach us a lot about, uh, you know, more ordinary people, uh, you know, not, not the royalty, the non-royals. One more question uh, from Kip Karana. Um, you, and you just mentioned about all these different gods were like for protection purposes, they would protect different groups. What did the kings who went to the underworld need protection from? Why do they need protectors? Why is the underworld so dangerous? Why, you know, because a lot of the ancient world's ideas had a lot to do with you need to be protected when you go over. Yeah, because those, well, those uh, beings in the netherworld, as I think I mentioned, could also be hostile if you don't know how to approach them because they were guardians. So they were also guarding those regions. Mm -hmm. And so in order to, to go through, you, you, you really need to know how to address them. So here, this is the sort of secret knowledge, mm -hmm. the esoteric knowledge that the disease needs to, to have. And the protection is also at the bodily uh, level so the the protection is the protection first of all of the tomb on earth of the coffin of the mummified body and then it continues in the in the netherworld but it started actually from the tomb so it's first of all protection mm -hmm. of the body mm -hmm. I would say perfect um, here's something that all children ask in, in whatever religion they are, is the netherworld or paradise thought of as an imaginary out of reality place or is it in the sky or is it a physical place somewhere in the west where the sun sets? You know, I mean, how do they think about this? It, it's really a bit everywhere in the sense that we have those <laughs> images that speak about a celestial region, a region in the sky and uh, the boat um, travels in the sky and uh, uh, for instance, in the pyramid text, there are spells where it is said that the king is looking for a way to ascend to the sky. And so either there is a, a, a stair or a, uh, it transforms into smoke. Uh, there are different uh, ways to, to reach the sky. But then we have all these uh, Im images of an underworld, which is clearly a subterranean world with uh, Sands, also course of water, but is uh, the um, is the, um, the 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 um, realm of uh, of the night. So it's 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 like a, a journey that starts in the sky with the sun racing in the east, and then and and enter the the underworld from the west. And the west is also the the part um, the place connected to the cemetery where the tombs are, because that's where uh, uh, then also the sun god uh, starts to uh, the journey during the night in the underworld to meet with the body of Osiris. So all those images I, I've been showing, they, they were all about this journey in the sky and in the, under, in the underworld. Well, this is a question for Rene, and we couldn't get through this without this question. Is it true that the story of Moses bringing the Hebrews out of Egypt really happened during the reign of Ramses II? <laughs> well, if you believe Charlton Heston, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, uh, it's, it's likely to have been actually not Ramses II, but, it, you know, if you, if you figure out um, when, when the Israelites were 
in Egypt. And, you know, sometimes you can read the Old Testament as history, you know, that it's more likely to have been Meremta, his son, uh, than Ramses II, but Hollywood uh, made it Ramses. And, but, um, you know, it's about, it's around the same time, I would it's say. The same time. But it's always helpful to have the Pharaoh have the great on his name <laughs> for a Hollywood movie. It's an extra million tickets sold. Um, <laughs> So uh, here's a question. I was surprised to learn that Ramses II moved his capital to the Nile Delta. Do we know why then he built Abu Simbel so far away in Upper Egypt? I mean, was he trying to cover the whole? Yeah. Go Absolutely. Uh, um, he was covering all his bases. <laughs> and, and, and remember where the traditional enemies were uh, to the south. He secured those borders and, and uh, expanded them. So this was part of his kingdom. But um, as I say, in the Delta area, that's likely to be the home of, of all of the Ramses um, and Setis uh, during that dynasty. Uh, but consider also the ability to muster an army uh, if you're fighting up in Syria, for example, um, or even Libya um, to the west, uh, having, having um, a secure place up in the north would also uh, protect the com country from that and from uh, the um, pi pirates coming from the Mediterranean. So, you know, having these two kingdoms really helps secure the boundaries of Egypt. Of course, thanks for all your great questions, and uh, there's time for just one more. And uh, here's someone who clearly grew up also hedging his bets. Are there only two options in death, paradise or hell, or, or are there more than two? <laughs> I'm feeling a bit like uh, this religious... <laughs> <laughs> you, you have become uh, the guru of, the, of uh, ancient Egyptian ritual, not religion. Yeah. <laughs> No, so there wasn't a conception really of you know, what we would call a, a, a place in between, a purgatory. Mm -hmm. um, not really. So yeah, I will say either you pass the judgment, make sure that the devourer doesn't eat your hurt mm -hmm. and become an ak, a transfigured spirit, or you will stay a dam damned one and maybe go back on earth trying to uh, bring illness uh, to to the living. Uh, we found spell where it is said that the evil dead has been bringing illness. Uh, we even have letters to the dead in which uh, individuals write to their dead relatives when those are coming on earth to disturb them. Uh, and those are really, indeed, um, documents that let us know how non-royal people uh, think and especially there is a very nice one in which, uh, uh, very funny one in which um, uh, husband writes to the dead wife. Uh, apparently, the dead wife was upset and was disturbing him, and he say, "Why you're doing this to me? I always been good to you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You should you should forgive him me." Uh, basically, say something like, uh, "You should." Because I've been so good to you, you should forgive me if now I have another woman. <laughs> <laughs> so clearly the, the dead <laughs> wife was really upset. And that's what <laughs> <laughs> I've got to end on that. <laughs> that's too good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Our next program is December 2nd. It's going to be on Leonardo da Vinci. And we will hope to see you then. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. And thank you for those of you who watched the live stream. <laughs>